anthology of incisive writing with guts, as it says here, edited by Christopher Nosdeborg, featuring Diane McCain, A.D. Hitchin, D.M. Mitchell, Noel Rasputin, The Quill, Mistress Rosie, Mark Wynn, Michael McLaren, and more. I presume you know I'm on the end more on this stuff by then, no, I don't think she had chance. <laughs> Establishment, uh, and it's a piece I like to call Black Dog. What page is it on it? I don't fucking know. Okay. Check the contents page. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've got it. Right. All the money that I had in the world and all I was ever going to spend was sitting on the bar next to a pint glass of foamy dregs and a battered notepad. I picked up a fiver and waved it at a tattooed barman. The duly poured me a glass of whatever it was I'd been drinking and took my cash as he let the pint settle on the drip tray. The inane banter and piercing guffaws from the invidious half-wit in the corner and his small entourage were almost deafening. I'd been drinking in this pub for two years and that odious twat's voice felt like the soundtrack to all the pointless hours I'd whiled away in here. The barman, I think his name was Ian or Scott or Tarquin or something like that, handed me my glasses and coins. I took them and the rest of my belongings and walked out into the beer garden. It was empty, which I was thankful for. I needed time and silence to formulate a plan. I rolled a fag, lit it, took a drag, and opened my notepad. Tonight was my last night on earth. This was not some vague, paranoid inkling or a world-shattering prophetic revelation. This was a clear and conscious decision that I had made some time ago. Thirty-two days ago, as a matter of fact. 32 days, 6 hours and 23 minutes ago to, even do, to be even more exact. The feeling of ho such hollow futility that I woke with, with every day had finally grown unbearable. My few hours of sleep at night were punctured by very real dreams of utter panic and despair, and all that I saw when I closed my eyes was the vision of my neck in a noose. A black dog was haunting me and hunting me and would not relent. I had moved towns, moved cities, but could not outrun it. I tried drowning it in drink, but it was only me who drowned. Every morning before breakfast and the nothingness of my day job, I stared down the jaws of that big black beast until I could stand no more. Until I acquiesced, rolled out the white flags and surrendered to my invariable destiny. As soon as I had made that monumental decision, it was like the biggest burden had been lifted from my back. I felt a sense of what I can only describe as something akin to inner peace, a feeling I had never before felt in my 43 years on this godforsaken dust bowl. I was suddenly lucid and focused, and at once set about planning my own demise, the means to my end. After extensive research, I settled on the method I would employ, having weighed up success rates, reliability, implications of failure, and the level and duration of pain. With the technicalities out of the way, I sat down and, comp and composed a list of ten acts that I considered utterly essential for me to perform before I shuffled politely off this mortal coil. I quit my job and pulled all my worldly resources to subsidise a fighting fund in order to support me and finance the execution of my ambitions. My worldly resources did not amount to much, so time was of the essence. Looking down at the list in my notepad, nine of the ten had been crossed out. I'll spare you the details concerning the nature of the deeds done. Many of them were sordid, and some almost physically impossible to perform. Suffice to say, there was one more item on the agenda that needed to be addressed. Number 10. Kill a man who truly deserves it. Right on cue, the door opened, and the odious twat from inside stepped out. He looked up and lurched towards me like a cartoon paedophile. <laughs> Get away with me! His voice was like the screaming brakes of a bus barreling towards me. He took my zipper from the table and sat down, despite the fact that A, he hadn't been invited, 
and B, it would be apparent to anybody that there were no sense of perception that I clearly embodied this piece of human flotsam. That this was a man with absolutely no care or comprehension of other people. Well, still, this was a drunk man with absolutely no care or comprehension of other people. <laughs> That girl that I'm sitting in there, right, you're sitting in there with, right, yeah, the, the, the one with the massive tits, she's all over me like a cheap suit, mate. I'll tell you what, I am definitely going to get my nuts warm tonight. Nuts warm? Christ on a bike. But what's your name, pal? I've seen you in here loads, isn't it? You must have asked me this on about 30 separate occasions. Each time I gave him a different answer. Tonight, I would be Troy. <laughs> Troy, I said. Troy, that's it, he spat, slapping me on the shoulder. Listen, Troy, he leaned forward in his patio chair. You look like the kind of guy that smokes, but you know, marijuana. You reckon you can sort me out? This bird in there is one of those alternative types, all student like, you know what I mean, like tofu and that. I reckon a bit of weed would definitely be a leg opener. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I whispered and stooped in a conspiratorial manner. I just so happen to have some on me now. The twat clicked his fingers together in a faux urban accent trolled, A RESULT! It was like watching Tony Blair do an impression of Lethal Bizzle. <laughs> Meet me in the car park opposite in ten minutes. I picked up my pint and notepad and headed to the door before turning and emphasising in a hushed and uber serious tone, alone. He nodded knowingly and tapped a finger twice to his temple. Sorry, that was three times, wasn't it? Inside the pub, I sank the rest of my pint, put it on the bar, and ordered a shot of vodka. Nerves were beginning to get the better of me, and it felt like a thousand butterfly wings were beating beneath my ribs. I nicked the shot, thanked the barman, pushed open the doors, and crossed the road to the car park. I rolled another fag with trembling hands and sparked up. It wasn't supposed to be as easy as this. I had envisaged jumping halfway in an early on his way back home, or breaking into his house in the early hours. I began to doubt whether I actually had the balls and backbone to accomplish my final act. I even began to question whether the twat truly deserved to die. But as the doubts and divisions began to swell, so too did a visceral determination that soon surpassed them. The cold, tunnel-visioned automaton I had trained myself to become took control. I inhaled shut my eyes, and heard my own mantra beating at my skull like a kick drum. If you don't do this, your life is worth nothing. I exhaled and opened my eyes as the pub door swung open and out spilled the twat. As soon as I clocked him, all my reservations evanesced, and I knew at once that he would die by my, ha by my hand. For two years I had gone to see this cancerous polyp as the epitome of all that was wrong with mankind. A misogynistic homophobe and committed racist who wore his retarded prejudice, prejudices like a badge of honour, the twat had no discerning value or purpose. A money-grabbing little shit with an unjustified sense of self-worth. A socially advantaged grubshite with all the charm of a wrinkled sphincter and a project predilection for groping drunk girls' tits. No one would mourn his loss. Not a solitary tear would be shed. This would be my legacy my final gift to the world. The twat spotted me, raised his hand, and staggered across the road conspicuously. All right, he whispered loudly when he reached me. Over here, I took him by the elbow and led him to a recess behind a car park and some public toilets out of view of the main street. He fumbled in his trousers and fished out a wallet cracked with blues and browns as I reached inside the breast pocket of my jacket and felt the cold aluminium casing of the switchblade. As he pulled out two twenties, I took out the knife and flicked it open. The twat didn't notice. He was too busy looking at his money. What's the damage? He said. Oh, plenty. I deadpanned and plunged the blade deep into his gut. His wallet dropped to the floor and his body lurched forward compulsively. His hands grabbed my wrist. I pushed the blade in deeper and harder, watched his old gape mouth and wide manic eyes. Adrenaline sped up my veins. This was the biggest rush on earth, better than mainlining heroin, number three on the list. Or jumping out of a plane strapped to a fat lad with a parachute and tumbling towards terra firma, number six. This was proper, this was pure. I let him against him hard, pushed with all my strength and we fell crashing onto the tarmac. The full weight of my body plunged the knife in right up to the hill. Blood bubbled, 
blood bubbled beneath him crept quickly up his shirt. The twats battled for breath. I pulled out the blade and a warm stream of blood spewed from the wound and pepper dashed my face. Bastard. I ran my eyes in my coat sleeve and looked down at the pathetic specimen below me, twitching spasmodically. Fuck it, let's do this properly. I dropped into my knees and started stabbing and stabbing. Each thrust of the blade made me want to do it more. Two years of bottled up disgust and antipathy shaken up, uncorked and erupting in a mad frenzy. And then, all at once, I noticed that the twat had stopped twitching. I settled the flip knife on the floor and slowly raised myself up off my knees. Looking down at the blooded corpse, I felt that little bit of something akin to inner peace creep back. I picked the wallet up the floor, pulled out the tens and twenties, squeezed his cheeks and stuffed the cash down his gullet. It's the way he would have wanted it. Rifling through his pockets, I pulled out a packet of lucky strokes, lit one, took out my notepad and pen, and struck through the last item on my list. Kill a man who truly deserves it before tossing the book on the dead twat. Sweet Jesus, I need a drink. I was covered in his blood and smelled like a jockey's crotch that I could clean up in the public rooms and I knew a couple of bars that didn't necessarily adhere to a strict dress code policy. It was only half past nine and I still had 21 pounds and 47 pence in my pocket. Besides, this was my last night on earth. Cheers. Thank you.